So later in our schedule this afternoon, a House hearing, the Small Business Committee meeting this afternoon to look at light squared broadband technology and the GPS system. That's live at 1 on our companion network, C SPAN 3. Now to the House floor here on C SPAN. The House will be in order. Prayer will be led by our chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. We pray this day, O Lord, for peace in our world, that righteousness will be done with freedom, and freedom will flourish. The work of these days has concerned the interchange of goods, talent, and resources with other nations of the world. In your wisdom, you created many peoples and have asked us to live and work together so that all might know and experience your blessings. Send your spirit upon the members of this people's house that they might judiciously balance seemingly irreconcilable interests. Help them to execute their consciences and judgments with clarity and purity of heart so that all might stand before you, before you honestly and trust that you can bring forth righteous fruits from their labors. Bless us this day and every day, and may all that is done be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has exa examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof, and pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Forbes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to 15 one-minute requests on each side. For what purpose does the gentleman from West Virginia rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past week, West Virginia experienced a tremendous loss. Mylan Mike Pushkar, co-founder and former chairman and CEO of Mylan Labs in Morgantown, and the namesake at WVU's Milan Puskar Stadium passed away. Mike Donnelly was a visionary entrepreneur who grew Milan into the largest generic drug manufacturer in America, but he also is a beloved philanthropist who is passionate about our mountain state. He was an extremely su committed supporter of West Virginia University and gave selflessly of his time and treasure to the academic and athletic programs there. Milan had a kind heart and lived his life with the utmost integrity. The life he lived and the legacy he leaves behind have made West Virginia a better place for our children and grandchildren. My wife Mary and I, as well as all West Virginians and Mountaineer fans across this country, will keep Mike and his family in our thoughts and prayers. He will be missed by all. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Year's you rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to condemn the violence in Egypt. Months after Muslims and Christians fought for democracy, religious violence continued to plague the country. Worse yet, in post-revolution Egypt, violence against Coptic Christians is rising. This weekend, over two dozen people were killed in Cairo, most of them Coptic Christians. Demonstrators had gathered to protest the attack on the Coptic Church and other Christian-owned properties. 
In response, military officials aggressively confront the protesters by driving vehicles into crowds and shooting off live ammunition. In the end, 26 people were dead and hundreds were wounded. This brutal crackdown puts into question the ability of the military government to bring democracy to Egypt and protect its minority Coptic population. These military attacks are unacceptable and the resulting deaths are absolutely appalling. The Coptic Christians simply want respect for the churches, their homes, and their basic rights. Democracy cannot thrive in Egypt if the rights of Coptic Christians are not respected. The United States must do everything it can to pressure military leaders to end the violence, punish those responsible, and uphold the equal rights of all Egyptian citizens. To what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to honor a soldier who made the ultimate sacrifice and laid down his life for our freedom, United States Army Private First Class David A. Drake. Private First Class Drake enlisted in the United States Army in January 2011. In the Army, he served as a combat engineer, leading from the front with his unit, the 515th Engineer Company, 5th Engineer Battalion, 4th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade, and deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. On September 28, 2011, he gave his life in Ghazni Province, Afghanistan, conducting operations against the enemy. David is remembered not only for his heroics on the battlefield, but for the tremendous impact he had on his family, friends, and his community. His brother recalls David's absolute devotion to others in describing why he joined the Army. For him, it was pride in serving our, our country, serving the people, keeping our freedom. His character and patriotism are an example for us all. Private First Class David Andrew Drake personifies the honor and selflessness of service in the United States Army. His bravery and dedication to duty will not be forgotten. As a Marine Corps combat veteran, my deepest sympathies go out to his family, his fellow soldiers, and to all who knew him. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to voice my support for older Americans and pledge to protect the program they have paid into, have been promised, and deserve. Throughout much of the year, we have heard how Congress needs to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security benefits under the guise of deficit reduction. I reject that premise. I do so for Dale, a Sacramento resident who is 70 years old, recently retired with his wife. The dream of retirement went well for a short while. Then utility and home repair bills started piling up. And if this weren't enough, both Dale and his wife have suffered deteriorating health, which has increased their medical bills to levels they cannot afford. Cuts to Medicare or Social Security would, as Dale put it, quote, take from the poorest of the poor, unquote. That is unacceptable. Any proposal to meet our deficit must meet the test of protecting our seniors. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Generally yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, I rise today on behalf of the Congressional Prayer Caucus to note the importance of prayer in our nation's history. On October 12, 1844, 167 years ago today, John Chambers, the governor of Iowa Territory, issued a proclamation declaring a day of thanksgiving to God. Chambers said in part, I've deemed it proper to recommend a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God for the many and great blessings we enjoy as a people and individually, and a prayer and supplications for the continuance of His mercy and goodness towards us all, and for the prosperity, happiness, and ultimate salvation of the American people. We are told that righteousness exalteth a nation, and are taught by divine authority that the voice of thanksgiving and prayer is acceptable to our Father in heaven. Let us then unite our voices in the humble hope that they will reach the throne of grace and obtain for us a continuation and increase of blessings. And Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? 
Without objection, so ordered. Um, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize National Physician Assistant Week, which is observed annually through October 6th through October 12th. On October 6, 1967, the first PAs graduated from Duke University. Today, more than 40 years later, legions of practicing PAs have reached over 83,000 people and three, reached the numbers of over 83,000 and 307 million patient visits PAs last year alone. I know firsthand the key role of, PA, of the PA profession in the delivery of care before serving in office, I worked for nearly a decade as a PA and served as a clinical instructor training future PAs. Created in response to a shortage of primary care physicians, the PA profession today is crucial to developing a strong primary care workforce. Not only do PAs provide high quality cost effective care in virtually all healthcare settings, PAs also extend the reach of medicine to underserved communities throughout the U.S. With health care reform expanding access to 33 million Americans, PAs are needed more now than ever. Mr. Speaker, as we mark the final day of PA Week, I ask my colleagues to join me in celebrating the contribution as well as the promise of the PA profession. I yield back the balance of time. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, the House today will vote on a jobs plan that will create thousands of jobs for Americans. I'm talking about the pending free trade agreement with Colombia that has been waiting for years to be voted on. In my great home state of Texas, new jobs will be created in exporting the exporting sectors like petroleum, chemicals, and machinery. Texas is the number one state that exports to Colombia. But in my district alone, the 22 companies that exported to Colombia last year paid almost $12 million in unnecessary tariffs. When tariffs on these products are removed, United States companies will be able to expand their markets, export more products, and create American jobs. And America will become more of a competitive country in the international marketplace. I've been to Colombia, and unlike some South Americans, Colombians like Americans. They are a U.S. ally. Free trade with Colombia helps both nations and solidifies our joint interests in South America. This agreement is a diplomatic win to help thwart the influence of the dictator Chavez of Venezuela in that region. Create jobs. Pass the free trade agreement with Colombia. It's good for Americans and it's good for Colombians. And that's just the way it is. Gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? Gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare were created because they reflect the values of our country and we should be incredibly proud of these programs which provide a vital safety net for our seniors and we should commit ourselves to strengthening them. Seniors like Rita Manley in my district who depend on Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Rita is 82 years old, suffering with cancer and she lives in Central Falls, Rhode Island. She was recently laid off from her job at the Central Falls Housing Authority and relies on Social Security for income and Medicare to cover her medication which costs about $400 a month. Rita would not be able to afford her cancer medication without the support of Medicare. We should do everything we can to protect and strengthen Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid for seniors like Rita all across this country. Our seniors deserve and have earned the benefits provided in these programs. They deserve to live their retirement years with dignity. We should not ask seniors to sacrifice benefits before asking the wealthiest Americans and largest corporations to pay their fair share. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Gentleman's recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise to honor the 39 wounded in the memory of the 17 killed who were aboard the USS Cole when it was attacked by terrorists this day 11 years ago. I had the privilege of representing Norfolk Naval Station, the home port of the USS Cole. On the morning of October 12, 2000, the USS Cole was moored <coughs> off the coast of Aden, Yemen. And around 11.18 a.m., a small craft approached the port side of the ship and exploded, ripping a 40 by 40 foot gash through the steel of the destroyer. The ship's galley, where the crew was gathering for lunch, took a direct hit. The attack was organized and executed and planned by Osama bin Laden. And in his death, justice was served. 
But at the dinner table of 17 American families, there sits an empty chair. What should be a joyous family gathering is tempered by the loss of a loved one. So we pause today, and rightly so, to honor and remember those who stand boldly in defense of America and defense of freedom. We must meet our deep obligation to them, to our veterans and the families of the fallen. May God forever bless the crew and families of the USS Cole, past and present, and may God forever bless the United States of America. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, the Republican budget would turn the American dream into a nightmare for millions of senior citizens, eliminating Medicare, threatening Social Security benefits, and turning Medicaid into a block grant. Those same proposals are now being discussed in the Select Committee on Deficit Reduction. Seniors are terrified, and they are speaking out against cuts. People like Debbie from Wilmette, Illinois, a public school teacher whose husband was diagnosed with MS and forced to send, sell his business at a loss. She says, my husband only gets $1,800 a month now. There is no way we'll be able to keep our house and pay our bills. We are worried, unquote. Or Nerlene from Chicago, who lives on her Social Security check, quote, Medicare helps with my medication. I'm living month to month, and I always run out of food before the next month. I really miss getting the cost of living increase because my rent takes half my income, unquote. Let's listen to Debbie and Nerlene and millions of seniors. Let's reject benefit cuts. I yield back. General Lady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Mississippi rise? Gentlemen's recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to once again urge the administration to issue drilling permits in the Gulf of Mexico in a more timely and efficient manner. As demonstrated at today's natural resources hearing, there is a critical need to correct the regulatory backlog. The long-term effects of the moratorium and subsequent regulatory slowdown will lead to decreased development levels in the Gulf of Mexico, which will reduce oil and gas production levels and associated employment and economic activity in the Gulf South's economy. Recent reports show that up to 20 deepwater drilling rigs could leave the Gulf of Mexico due to the slow, uncertain pace of the permit process. Continued regulatory uncertainty will only exacerbate this trend as operators reallocate resources to other major offshore provinces. President Obama has said over and over that jobs in the economy is administration's number one priority. Well, Mr. President, the Gulf of Mexico sits ready to work. Let's put her to work for America. I yield back. Members are reminded to direct their remarks to the chair. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today and to recognize the Association of Amputee Surfers and its founder, Dana Cummings. On Saturday, I participated in Amp Surf's sixth annual Operation Restoration on Pismo Beach in California. Together, disabled veterans and other people with disabilities took to the water and learned to surf with the help of the local surfers. This event proved that the power of the ocean can inspire, educate, and rehabilitate the disabled, especially our veteran warriors. Earlier this year, I had met one of those veteran warriors at Bethesda Naval Hospital. He was recovering from injuries sustained from an IED attack in Afghanistan. But before he enlisted in the Marines, Cody had volunteered with Amp Surf right there on Pismo Beach, and it was a special treat to see his mother at the beach on Saturday supporting all those in the water as her son rehabilitates. I know Cody and so many others are resolved and determined to get back out in the water, and they'll be able to do it with the help of Amp Surf. Cody's story brings Amp Surf's wonderful cause full circle. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, please join me in honoring Amp Surf and what it does for our veterans and those who share the powerful forces of sacrifice, perseverance, and healing. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise? Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The President has proposed the American Jobs Act to get people back to work. The bill will revitalize American manufacturing and invest in infrastructure to create jobs now. It contains proven ideas for job creation that have received bipartisan support, 
and economists agree. Mark Zandi at Moody says that passing the bill will create almost two million jobs and won't add a dime to the deficit. So why aren't we passing the bill now? Sadly, last night, Senate Republicans stood with House Republicans to stop the American Jobs Act from even coming to a vote. In fact, in 40 weeks in which they've been in control of the House, Republican leaders have never called a vote on a jobs bill. It's time we put the country first in the face of this tough economy. Last month, I welcomed some amazing World War II veterans to their memorial here in D.C., who shared with me their great challenges of their time, how they set their differences aside and pulled together for the good of the country. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's time for us to pull together for the good of the country for the great economic challenges we face today. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas rise? Mr. Address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to praise a not-for-profit organization in Kansas that I recently visited. Cottonwood, located in Lawrence, Kansas, provides a valuable service to our country by establishing employment and living opportunities to individuals with developmental disabilities. Over the years, Cottonwood has earned a reputation for quality services and care as a community service provider. At Cottonwood, workers help make a number of consumer products, including industrial strength car cargo straps that are used by our troops here at home and overseas for a variety of purposes. Thanks to the workers at Cottonwood, our soldiers have a great and much needed tool to help them do their jobs and keep them safe. Cottonwood is a shining example of the potential within every American that can be developed and maintained when local community groups couple with the private sector to create products at, good, at a good value for our American military and other consumers. I am proud to use my voice on the floor of the U.S. House to praise Cottonwood and other organizations who provide meaningful employment for Americans with disabilities across the United States. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask you now consent to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, as policymaker, it is our job to learn from the mistakes of the past and not repeat them. Nearly 700,000 American jobs have been lost as a direct result of NAFTA. In my district, the 43rd Congressional District, we have lost over 2,000 jobs since the passage of NAFTA and other trade agreements. And the United States has gone from a 1.6 billion trade surplus to a $97 billion trade deficit with Mexico. Yet we stand this week ready to pass three more NAFTA-style trade agreements, Korea, Colombia, and Panama. My constituents face a 14% unemployment rate. They need us to create jobs, not ship them overseas, where thousands of jobs will be sent over. I ask yourself, who benefits from these trade deals? Not the American working families, Major corporations are the ones who benefit with this misguided agreement. This is a debate about the haves and the haves not. It is time to stand up for working families. I say it's time to stand up for working families and do the right thing for the American people. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado rise? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last month, Americans around the country commemorated the 10th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. I had the honor and privilege to spend the day with some of the brave police, firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, and first responders that put their lives on the line every day to protect us from harm. In Berthoud and then in Fort Collins, Colorado, I had the opportunity to speak with local firefighters and police as we remembered the tragedy of 10 years ago and the sacrifice and, lie and loss of so many lives. The lapel pin that I have on this morning was lent to me by a friend of mine, Ed Haynes. It's a pin given to New York Police Department police officers in the wake of September 11th. An officer gave it to Ed in 2004. The pin is a reminder of that day and the understanding that police officers and firefighters around the country share. The understanding that every day they go to work willing to give their own lives to save the lives of others. As the 10-year anniversary of September 11th passed, we remembered the victims and the devastation, the fear and the anger of that time. But we also remember the unity, the sense of understanding that existed across the nation in the days after that horrible tragedy. The people that have observed September 11th over this past month, September 11th through today, the people that I saw that weekend, the firefighters, the police and the citizens remember those days as well. 
And in today's political environment, we could do well to focus on how it should not require a national tragedy to bring us together. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? With permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, we talk a lot about our different concerns for the future of our nation, but there is one gravely serious threat that exists in every single congressional district and could cripple future generations in the long-term strength of our nation. More than 12 million American citizens, children, 17 percent, are currently obese. In my home state of Kentucky, the number is even worse, with obesity affecting 37 percent of Kentucky kids. That's millions of children who are at a significantly higher risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, millions at risk of having their dreams cut short, and millions who may not get the chance to contribute all their potential to our nation's growth. I'm proud to applaud the work of Cozair Children's Hospital in Louisville, one of dozens of children's hospitals around the U.S. taking new steps to educate kids about the importance of eating healthy and getting active. Children's hospitals are essential allies in the battle to stop childhood obesity. I urge my colleagues to support these initiatives and every effort to get our kids focusing on a fitter future. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unemployment numbers just came out for our country, and again, we see the country at 9.1 percent unemployment. The number one issue that we face here in this body and in our government, I would argue, is jobs in the economy. This week we have an opportunity to come together in a bipartisan fashion. The President has talked about the trade agreements with both South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. And I think this is an opportunity for us to be able to level the playing fields to allow the American worker to win. We know that if we level the playing field, the American worker can win. And we know that if we take South Korea alone, this is an opportunity for us to add $10 billion to our GDP. For every a billion dollars that we send in exports, we create 6,250 jobs right here at home. 73% of the dollars are outside of the United States and 95% of the consumers. We want to make sure that we're selling American abroad. This is an opportunity for us to put American workers back to work, try to lower the unemployment rate from 9.1% and move the country forward. I ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to come together today and this week to pass the free trade agreements and move our country ahead. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut seek recognition? Just ask for one minute and revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Free trade deals are not an industrial policy. Unlike most industrial countries in the world, the United States is the only one that has no overall strategy for bringing back the five million manufacturing jobs that we've lost in the last decade or reopening the 50,000 factories that have been shuttered. Without enforcing current trade laws, or pressuring China to adopt fair currency policies, or using U.S. taxpayer dollars to benefit U.S. companies, we are on the losing end of free trade before the deals are even negotiated. Where's the focus on industrial education? Where's the focus on requiring other countries to live up to their trade obligations? Where's the focus on making sure that U.S. taxpayer dollars are spent on U.S. jobs? Now, I get the benefits of free trade, but come to Waterbury, Connecticut, New Britain, Connecticut, and Meriden, Connecticut, and what you will hear is a cry for help, not for more trade deals, but for a country that recognizes what every other developing and industrial country has in this world, that we need a domestic industrial policy to protect and support our manufacturers here before we engage in free trade deals abroad. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the general from Maryland rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to job creation, the American people are not waiting for the right speech, but rather the right leadership. While the Obama administration claims to seek common ground on which to help employers hire workers, House Republicans have already produced and passed more than a dozen job-creating bills through the House this year. We're going to do that here later today with the three trade bills that will create 250,000 jobs. Unfortunately, these measures have long been ignored by the Senate and the White House. Where was the leadership? If President Obama is serious about helping create jobs, then he must listen to what job creators are actually saying. More than anything else, they need long-term confidence that Washington will stop punishing them with reckless red tape and threatening them with new taxes. House Republicans are ready to work with the President, 
but not if it means supporting policies that only work against job creators and job seekers. Yield back to balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? The House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Some few weeks ago, the President addressed this Congress and this hall about jobs and introduced the American Jobs Act. Something that would help small businesses, something that would help put policemen and firemen and teachers to work, something that would help rebuild schools, a bill that would appropriately put Americans back to work and address our problems. But the Senate killed it yesterday. We should have known, and we did know the Senate would kill it, because Senator McConnell said right after the President was sworn in, our main job is to see that he's not reelected. The President's in support of these trade agreements. I'm not. He is. The Republicans are, but they don't give him credit for it. They condemn him today, the previous speaker, and yet he's for the trade agreements. He couldn't do anything for them. He, if he made them a kidney transplant, they'd want to. There's nothing he could do they would think was right. We need to create jobs. It's the main issue in my district and in this nation, and we need to work together to create jobs in America. And the millionaires need to pay their fair share. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I yield back the balance of my time. For, for what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Just the House for one minute. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night, uh, I was disappointed, though not surprised, to see uh, the Senate uh, fail to arrive at the number of votes needed to bring closure so that the American Jobs Act could be debated. They not only don't want to pass the jobs bill, they don't even want to debate the jobs bill. I thought that was an embarrassing moment for the U.S. Congress because with 9.1 percent unemployment, with people who have been chronically unemployed for so long, one would think that we'd want to get down here and talk about jobs, bring forth our ideas, offer amendments, do everything we could to try to help spur the American economy on. And yet, we saw that jobs bill go down. Mr. Speaker, the American people know that Congress can bring things up and they can bring things up again. And as long as Americans are unemployed at the disgraceful rates that they are today, I hope Congress will never stop fighting to continue to bring jobs bills back to this Congress. The Republican majority in this House has yet to bring a, a jobs bill. We hope to see one one day soon. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, passing the South Korea, Colombia, and Panama trade agreements will decrease our trade deficit and make it easier for U.S. companies to compete on a global level. Specifically, the U.S.-Colombia Trade Promotion Agreement levels the playing field for Texas exports and translates into a potential duty-free savings of $180 million for this fast-growing regional market. For example, in the district I represent, Texas 22, Schlumberger exported $6.7 million in machinery parts to Columbia in 2010 and paid over $336,000 in duty fees. In Texas 22 alone, over 107,000 jobs are directly supported by over $57 billion in exports. Free trade means more money, money that stays with the companies in America, money that can be used to expand American businesses and grow American jobs. I urge my colleagues to level the playing field for American businesses by supporting these three free trade agreements. Let's export American goods and services, not American jobs. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Hawaii rise? The gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the trade agreements are front and center for us right now. But I have to ask you, what are you waiting for? We talk about deficits, we talk about debt, we talk about trade agreements, but what is it that really would have an impact? And that is if you would set for hearing the whole concept of currency manipulation. We have got to address China's manipulation of its yuan. I just came running over from 
task, Armed Services Committee, and one of the issues that was raised there was, we have got to do something about the Wan. China is outbuilding us. China is going to try and take over the Pacific. China is building ships. China is doing all of these things that puts our defense and our people at risk. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask you again, what are you waiting for? Let's hear that currency manipulation bill that has 226 of us, bipartisan support. Let's hear it. Time to really come to grips with what is truly our problem. How this bill will then affect issues such as the deficit and the debt and increase our GDP. Think about it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? Without objection, the gentleman from Washington is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, it's a very important day today. 519 years ago, Columbus discovered America. He was on a trade mission. But the problem is that today, instead of dealing with trade missions and all the rest, we ought to have a bill out here that the President presented on creating jobs for American workers. Now, this Congress has been in session for 300 and some odd days, with the Republicans talking about all the problems of the society and how the President's plan hasn't worked. They have yet to bring to this floor a presentation of a way to create jobs for American workers. These trade agreements, they say, well, if we have the level playing field with Korea and all these other places, suddenly we'll have a lot of jobs here. There is a much better way and a much surer way to provide jobs here in this country. My previous, my predecessor here talked about manipulation by the Chinese of our currency, which has been estimated to create or cut out a million jobs. There's other things we ought to be doing today than these free trade agreements. Chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir, pursuant to the permission granted in Clause 2H of Rule 2 of the Rules of the U.S. House of Representatives, the Clerk received the following message from the Secretary of the Senate on October 12, 2011, at 9.11 a.m., that the Senate passed Senate 1619. With best wishes, I am, signed sincerely, Karen L. Haas. Pursuant to Clause 1C of Rule 19, further consideration of H.R. 3078 will now resume. We'll report the title. Union Calendar Number 156, H.R. 3078, a bill to implement the United States-Columbia Trade Promotion Agreement. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, has 30 minutes, and the gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I yield one minute to a distinguished member of the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Berg. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, we've been waiting for this trade agreement for a long time. Every day that goes by without them has been a missed opportunity. At a time when our economy is struggling, these trade agreements mean more opportunities for Americans. They mean more American exports, and most importantly, they mean more American jobs. We've already seen the benefits of trade in North Dakota. Our exports have more than doubled over the last five years because of our renewed commitment to free trade. These trade agreements before us today could increase exports by $23 million in North Dakota alone and $13 billion nationwide. If we're serious about creating jobs, if we're serious about getting our economy back on track and allowing the U.S. to stay competitive in a fast-moving global market, passing these trade agreements is a critical first step. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting them. Thank you, and I yield the remainder of my time. One from Michigan, Mr. Levin is recognized. I yield one minute to the very distinguished gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps. Gentlelady is recognized for one minute. I thank my colleague for yielding. 
I rise today in opposition to the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, and I oppose this bill for many reasons. First, Colombia does not yet meet the high standards we should be demanding of our trading partners. While Colombia has made admirable progress, trade unionists continue to be brutally murdered and attacked. This is unacceptable. We can't just look the other way and hope things get better. But second, this agreement makes permanent the trade preferences that have absolutely devastated California's cut flour industry, which produces 80% of domestically grown flour. This agreement continues millions of dollars in subsidies for Columbia flower growers, but provides no such support for our domestic growers. Now, California's growers have developed a plan to cut costs and compete globally, but they can't do it alone. It's only fair that our domestic flower growers get a little help from their government, too. This FTA is a huge missed opportunity to help this valued domestic industry. For these and so many other reasons, I urge my colleagues to vote no on the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, and I yield back. General yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I yield a minute to a distinguished member of the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman from Kansas, Ms. Jenkins. General ladies recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for yielding, and thank you for all your leadership uh, in this area. It has been nearly five years since we signed our trade agreement with Colombia, and although I'm disappointed that it took this long, I am so pleased we will be ratifying this agreement today. Once this trade deal has passed, we will finally have what our trade subcommittee chairman, uh, Representative Brady, has correctly labeled a sell American agreement with the third largest economy in South and Central America. Exports of American goods will increase by more than $1 billion, and the ITC expects our stagnant GDP will get a boost of at least $2.5 billion. Not to mention Kansas wheat farmers can look forward to an even larger share of the Colombian grain market. It's been five years in the making, but we are finally here. I urge my colleagues to come together and support the pro-jobs, pro-growth Colombian free trade agreement. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, is recognized. Now my real privilege to yield three minutes to the distinguished uh, member of our committee, uh, Mr. Lewis of Georgia. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my uh, friend and, and colleague, uh, Mr. Levin, for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to the United States Columbia Free Trade Agreement. Now, some of my colleagues do not believe that the issue of human rights and the issue of the rule of law should be addressed through our trade policy. Some believe it is not about stolen land, ramshack homes. It is not about human rights activists whose families and friends were harassed and disappeared it is not about murder labor leaders. It is not about a crisis that is only kin to Sudan. Trade for the sake of trade, money for the sake of money. Let someone else care. Let someone else do it. Let someone else work on human rights. Let someone else fight for justice. Let someone else worry about peace, order and tranquility. All we need to do is find the cheapest, fastest, and easy way to make a buck. My friends, we're mistaken. To believe that this is not about us, but the crisis in Colombia affects every part of our region. It affects millions forced from their homes, it helped to create the drug cartels and international gains. It impacts the cost of crack and cocaine on every single street in America. We cannot ask someone else to address the violence. We cannot lead the question of corruption and impunity to another leader, another generation. We must demand these answers now. If we don't, who will? It is up to us. We can do better. It is on our watch. Mr. Speaker, today is a very sad day. 
we could have taken our time and done it right. Today we are abandoning our duty to the people who elected us and to millions of Colombians who now know that their cries fell on deaf ears and cold hearts. We can do better. We must do better. This Congress, this administration must have the courage to stand up and do what is right and be on the right side of history. It is a missed opportunity for change, for good. We failed to do what is right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to a distinguished member of the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schock. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first, let me say thank you to the chairman for his leadership uh, in support of these agreements. And uh, let me say I agree with the president. The passage of the Colombia, Panama, and South Korea trade agreement will mean 250,000 new jobs at a time when our economy needs them most. But these trade agreements, Mr. Speaker, aren't just about new jobs. They're about the millions of Americans who rely on new markets and new customers. In my district in central Illinois alone, Illinois' farmers depend on customers in South Korea, in Panama, and in Colombia. And when the United States of America does nothing, we lose market share. Since the five years that this agreement was negotiated, five years ago, Colombians purchased 60% of their wheat from the United States farmers. Today, that number is 30%. It's costing jobs and it's costing opportunity here in our country. In manufacturing, in my home area, Caterpillar, one of the major manufacturers of our country, employs a lot of high-wage union jobs, manufacturing jobs. Eight out of 10 of the tractors that are built in my district are sent to other customers around the world. With only 5% of the world's population in this country, it takes a pretty defeatist mentality to believe that our country would be better off not selling to the other 95% of the world. Mr. Speaker, today, the House of Representatives will pass a jobs bill. A jobs bill that can pass the House, a jobs bill that can pass the Senate, and a jobs bill, Mr. Speaker, that the President of the United States has already said he will sign into law. And this jobs bill, Mr. Speaker, does not require a tax increase. This jobs bill does not require us to go into debt. And this jobs bill has bipartisan support and is good not only for current Americans, but more importantly, it's good for future Americans and the future generation of America. I urge passage of these three bills. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I now yield three minutes to the ranking member on the Trade Subcommittee of Ways and Means, Mr. McDermott of Washington. The gentleman is recognized. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, we are all proud members of the United States Congress. We consider this the preeminent legislative body in the world that sets the standard for how the world should create laws and how we should govern our country. We believe in the rule of law. We talk about it all the time. We're for the rule of law. Well, that is the nub of this argument about why so many of us will vote against the Colombian Free Trade Agreement. Now, we all know the horrors, and we've, we'll hear them repeated again and again, but the fact is that we forced the government of Colombia, President Obama did, to sit down and write a labor action plan in which they said what they would do. We had listened for a couple of years to the previous administration, the Uribe administration, promise, 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 nothing happened. So this president said, I want it in writing, write down a labor agreement. It set out the precise steps that Colombia had to take to address the particular problems faced in that country. For example, steps Colombia could take to detect sham subcontractors and punish employers for using them to suppress worker rights. But we went down to very specific things. Why was that? Well, many of us who've been here a while were here when we passed NAFTA. 
And we thought we'd read it and understood what it meant, but we didn't understand a lot of what happened. Because we agreed that we wouldn't put the labor into the agreement, we'd write a side letter. And we wouldn't put the environment into the agreement, we'd put it in a side letter. Maquila Doras would be taken care of, the Rio Grande would be cleaned up. Nothing happened because it wasn't in the agreement. It did not have the force of law of the United States Congress behind it. So when we came to this, we didn't seal the deal. We said to the president, we want that in there. And the president talked to the Republicans and back and forth it went. And, and the Republicans were absolutely, implacably opposed to putting in any mention of the Columbia Action Plan. Now, if somebody says they're going to do something, you take them at their face value. Sure, they're going to do it. But then write it down here. Just let's put it right in there so there's never any confusion about what it was you said you were going to do. But the Republicans insisted that this be as wide open as the NAFTA agreement, that it not have built into it the one thing that makes this so, so difficult for us to deal with. If we believe in workers' rights, and if we believe in human rights in this place, and we talk about it all the time, we talk about it for every country in the world, but when we write a trade agreement for Colombia, we're unwilling to write in the demands for the Colombian workers. That's what's wrong with this, and that's why most of us will vote against it. I yield back the balance of my time. General from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quayle. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the chair for his excellent leadership in this because it's taken five years too long, but finally the House will have the opportunity to vote on the three pending free trade agreements. And we have to understand that America competes in the global economy. And if we ignore this, we ignore it at our own peril. And while these free trade agreements have been languishing on the president's desk for five years, we have actually lost market share to the EU, to Canada. And those are the things that are going to keep our economy from growing again. Now, if you look at just for the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, since we have actually drafted that agreement, $3.85 billion in unnecessary tariffs have been put on American products. When we actually have these free trade agreements in place, we're going to actually add to our economy and add to our, the jobs here in the United States. In my home district, we have a very robust uh, high-tech sector, and it's very heavily on trade. Last year, we had uh, $10 billion of free uh, trade going out in exports, and a lot of them have been going to countries that we actually have free trade agreements for. And 35,000 jobs are directly related to that. So I think that this is a jobs bill. I urge my colleagues to support all three free trade agreements, and I urge its passage. Fired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Uh, how much time on each side, please? Mr. Levin's got 23 minutes, and the gentleman from uh, Michigan, uh, Mr. Camp, has 25 minutes. Is how many? Uh, 25. You have 23, sir. Yeah, sure. I don't care. <coughs> gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp is recognized. All right. At this, at this time, Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to a distinguished <coughs> member of the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Ryan. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank the gentleman, Mr. Camp, for his leadership. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is just long overdue. This creates jobs. There is an issue that comes to the floor that has bipartisan support rarely these days. The Obama administration estimates this will create 250,000 new jobs. We agree. With respect to Columbia in particular, they have free access to our markets but we don't have free access to theirs. This gives us a level and equal playing field. Colombia is our strongest ally in the region. Colombia has done so much to help stop the proliferation of drugs coming to this country. They've helped us at the UN. More importantly, they want to buy our products. Where I come from, Mr. Speaker, we make things and we grow things. 20% of all the manufacturing jobs in Wisconsin require exports. $16.7 billion of our agricultural products in Wisconsin in 2009 were in exports 
creating 200,000 jobs in Wisconsin alone. 95% of the world's consumers, they're not in this country, they're in other countries. If you're standing still on trade, you're falling behind. All our trade competitors are going around the world, getting better agreements and better deals for their exporters, freezing us out. It's high time we pass these agreements to break down these barriers so that we can make and grow things in America and sell them overseas so we can create jobs. And that's exactly what these three agreements, especially Columbia, does, and I urge its passage. Thank you. John Mills back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, is recognized. Now my pleasure to yield three minutes to a member, a very active member of our committee, Mr. Doggett of the great state of Texas. I thank the gentleman. We need a new 21st century trade policy that encourages more trade without encouraging a race to the bottom in conditions for our workers and the quality of the air we breathe and the water we drink. Trade agreements should not be measured solely with regard to how many tons of goods move across a border, but they must consider the impact on how our workers are treated, how our environment is treated. And that's the very kind of trade policy that President Obama has said repeatedly he's committed to. Trade adjustment assistance is just not a substitute for a new trade policy that recognizes too often American jobs, too often American jobs have been a leading American export. All three of these Bush-Cheney trade agreements are deficient, but this one in particular shows just how far those who think that the only thing that matters in trade policy is the volume of goods from one country to another to the exclusion of everything else, how that narrow view insists today that we must have totally free trade with the trade union murder capital of the world. Yes, supporters of this free trade agreement have forgotten it's not free. It's not free to those who attempt to represent workers in Colombia. Last year, 49 trade union members were murdered in Colombia, and this year it's already up to 20. Human Rights Watch has just reported that there is virtually no progress in securing murder convictions. They got six out of 195 union member murders that were actually convicted. In nine of ten cases, the Colombians haven't even identified a suspect in these murders. You can talk of an action plan, and that's fine, but it's just like talk of a new trade policy. It's just talk and nothing else. This agreement denies any enforcement provision on the action plan that would make it actionable. LULAC, the League of United Amer Latin American Citizens, opposes this agreement, quite rightly calling for a new American trade policy that promotes living wages and sustainable jobs, encourages human rights, labor standards, and a healthy environment, not only here, but among each of our trading partners. Instead, today's agreement emplaces the principle that violence against the very people who make the goods being traded will be disregarded, will be overlooked, if only we can increase the trade volume of what they make reject this misguided agreement. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp is recognized. I, I yield myself such time as I may consume just to clear the record up that uh, obviously the murder in any, of any citizen in any country is something to be avoided, but let's just set the record straight that the homicide rate since 2002 against union members has declined 85 percent in Colombia. I think this is an example that the efforts of the Colombian government are succeeding and the homicide rate for the general population has declined by 44 percent and it's now uh, and, and kidnappings as well have declined. The ILO has also removed Colombia from their labor watch list. They did that in 2010 and recognizing their collective bargaining rules, recognizing the measures they've adopted to combat violence against trade union members and so we have a very different picture being painted by the reality there. Uh, I would also point, that, uh, point out that three main labor confederations have called the Labor Action Plan the most significant social achievement in Colombia in 50 years. And with that, I yield a minute to the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Diaz-Balart.
Minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank Chairman <coughs> Camp. I thank not only for, uh, for that, that great explanation that he just did, but for bringing. I keep hearing a lot about the horrors of Colombia. A couple facts. Because of the Andean Trade Pact uh, uh, Preferential Act, Colombian goods that come to the United States already basically come almost tariff free. This would even it out to our products created by American labor here can go to Colombia with the same preferential treatment. Fact number one. And fact number two. The chairman just talked about this. I keep hearing about this Colombia, which is really, frankly, a caricature, an offensive caricature of what Colombia really is. As if, as if we can just throw these things out there, pretending that it doesn't mean anything. Colombia is a democratic ally, Mr. Speaker. They have taken incredible steps to move forward to lower violence, to lower crime, they're to lower narco-trafficking. They're even now uh, training police forces across the world, including Mexico, in their fight against narco-terrorism. It's an offensive caricature uh, that the, the 